Upon his nomination to the Supreme Court by George W. Bush in 2005, there were initially questions regarding Roberts' judicial philosophy. Despite being widely recognized as a typically between the lines judge, many predicted that Roberts would align himself with the conservative members of the Supreme Court and rule accordingly. The Senate Judiciary Committee approved Roberts' nomination by a 13 to five vote, a vote significant enough to indicate that Roberts had sufficient support from the Senate to be filibuster proof. It is significant to mention that Roberts gained support from many leading Democratic senators. Roberts was ultimately confirmed by the Senate with a 78 to 22 vote. Over the course of his first four years on the Supreme Court, Roberts was integral in molding the freedoms of speech, press, and religion in the 21st century. Roberts' confirmation hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee proved integral to aid the public in understanding his judicial philosophies, as well as his interpretation to the First Amendment and how he planned to frame his rulings. When Senator Specter asked Roberts if he believed that the right to privacy exists within the Constitution, Roberts cited the First Amendment, stating, it's protected under the First Amendment, dealing with the prohibition on establishment of a religion and guaranteed free exercise, protects privacy in matters of conscience. His comment reflects a strict interpretation of the Constitution, in other words, a textual modality. Senator DeWine pressed Roberts on this strict textual modality by asking him if he believed that the First Amendment was flexible enough to exist in 2005 during the digital age, thus forcing Roberts to employ a different modality, as there is no textual modality for the internet in the Constitution. Roberts' response illustrated his willingness to employ alternative analysis when making decisions. But what I would like to do briefly is emphasize how the judicial branch is, how it must be, very different. I have great respect for our public officials. After all, they speak for the people, and that commands a certain degree of humility from those in the, of us in the judicial branch who do not. We do not speak for the people, but we speak for the Constitution. Our role is very clear. We are to interpret the Constitution and laws of the United States and ensure that the political branches act within them. That job obviously requires independence from the political branches. The story of the Supreme Court would be very different without that sort of independence. Without independence, there is no Brown versus Board of Education. Without independence, there is no West Virginia versus Barnett, where the court held that the government could not compel school children to salute the flag. And without independence, there is no steel seizure case, where the court held that President Truman was subject to the Constitution, even in a time of war. Now, the court has, from time to time, erred, and erred greatly. But when it has, it has been because the court yielded to political pressure, as in the Korematsu case, shamefully upholding the internment during, during World War II of Japanese American citizens. Those of us on the court know that the best way to do our job is to work together in a collegial way. Now, I'm not talking about mere civility, although that helps. I am instead talking about a shared commitment to a genuine exchange of ideas and views through each step of the decision process. We need to know at each step that we are in this together. There is a concrete expression of that collegiality in a tradition at the court that has prevailed for over a century. Before we go on to the bench to hear argument in a case, and before we go into the conference room to discuss a case, we pause for a moment and shake each other's hand. It's a small thing perhaps, but is, it is a repeated reminder that, as our newest colleague put it, we do not sit on opposite sides of an aisle, we do not caucus in separate rooms, we do not serve one party or one interest, we serve one nation. And I want to assure all of you that we will continue to do that to the best of our abilities 
whether times are calm or contentious. Thanks very much. So as we saw in the video, Chief Justice Roberts does not stand on either the Republican side or the Democratic side. He stands on the side of the Constitution and stands for what is right for the people of this nation. Uh, from the six modalities that Dr. Bobbitt uh, developed that encompass the Supreme Court's justice uh, use for decision making, Chief Justice Roberts uh, uses rhetorical frames uh, because those appeal to him. And the three top ones that he uses are textual modality, prudential modality, and doctrinal modality. In the case of Federal Election Commission versus Wisconsin Right to Life, we see how Chief Justice Roberts used these modalities to provide rationale on a First Amendment case. So in 2002, the BCRA attempted to regulate issue ads during the federal elections. So the issue ads provision prohibited the airing of ads that endorsed and attacked any uh, politicians within the 60 days of the general election. So Wisconsin Right to Life Inc. saw this as uh, them being stripped away from their freedom of speech. So they filed a suit against the Federal Election Committee and Chief Justice Roberts announced that the ads were actually in fact protected by the Constitution. He granted his decision using doctrinal and textual modality. And with the doctrinal modality, he basically used it to remove any personal biases. And also, um, as the president said, in a 1976 case of Buckley versus Vallejo. He then used textual modality to further his decision by saying, yet as it is often the case in the court's First Amendment opinions, we have gotten this far in the analysis without quoting the amendment itself. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The framers actual words put these cases in proper perspective. Hi everybody, my name is Noemi Martinez. And if there was ever a situation that you needed to present yourself in court with Chief Justice John Roberts, um, these are going to be some of the tips and advice you must utilize so that the justice finds your argument compelling. Uh, to begin with, and to begin with, there needs to be a logical explanation as to wanting to use the First Amendment, meaning that there needs to be a clear and convincing explanation as to why the rights were taken away. Advocates need to be aware of when speaking before the Chief Justice, some of the advice that is important is that the advocate should focus their argumentation on textual and doctrinal lines of reasoning. Uh, advocates should use prudential logic to reinforce the argumentation. However, the three most common and most important modalities the Chief Justice utilizes the most are doctrinal, textual, and prudential. Doctrinal modality is when the Supreme Court sets a precedent on what the interpretation means. Uh, in other words, what happened in the past gets applied to present cases. Uh, textual is the literal definition of a word. Uh, for example, like the sky is blue. Um, prudential interpretation uh, of a word. Prudential is the interpre interpretation of a word that was used before. Uh, it uses the same definition as before. Uh, when it was previously used. Uh, last of all, if those who decide to argue before uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, it is recommended that you consider using the same exact tactics he uses, uh, such as assessing the law from a perspective of a concise conscience, uh, which relies on textual, doctrinal, and prudential. Thank you. <laughs>